This is really what I think we all agree is the most exciting time of the year for the church where we go to the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents, of course, the meaning or the culmination of the plan of God. Everything that we're hoping for and looking forward to is fulfilled in the meaning of these feasts. And that makes them very special for us spiritually, so much to look forward to in that sense. And we also have, of course, the physical blessings that God commands us at these feast times. There's a great deal to look forward to. And that's why there's excitement. That's what we call it feast fever. So God has given us these feast days, which is the subject of the message today, talking about going to the feast because we're right there. We made our plans when it's time to go. Time to go, and there's an example I want to look at as our inspiration today in the book of Acts. So if you would come with me to the book of Acts, this is a episode, an episode in the life of Paul and the journeys of Paul. This would have been, I believe, a second missionary journey. And it's uh, verse uh, Acts 18. So if you come with me to Acts 18, this will form the theme of the message today, the theme that I want us to adapt for ourselves, the attitude that Paul had here when he decides, okay, here are my plans, this is what I'm going to do. So he comes in verse 19 of Acts 18, he came to Ephesus and he left them there, the traveling companions he was with. And he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So that was Paul's way of doing things. He'd come to a place and, of course, he went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. So this was his answer now in verse 22 of Acts 18. But he took leave of them took leave of them and saying, I must, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So this was his attitude at that time. I must keep this feast. I must go there. So where is Ephesus in relation to Jerusalem? So I have a little map here. Uh, this is a picture I'll get to in a minute, but if you take a look at the map, the journeys of Paul, Ephesus is here, where that photo was taken, those photos. Ephesus is here, and Jerusalem is here. And Paul, as the scripture says, he sailed from Ephesus. But if you were to take the overland route, that's about a thousand miles. A thousand miles, if I did my Google Maps correctly, this is a thousand mile journey overland, but he took the shorter sea route. And his attitude when he left them was to say, I must keep this feast. He had this journey to go on, leaving from Ephesus. So here's this photo here on the left. You see, Will and I were standing at Ephesus Theater. Now, later on in the book of Acts, Ephesus Theater is where the, the great riot occurred. In, an, in Paul's next journey to Ephesus. But if we looked to our left from that picture, that's the view we would see on the picture on the right. So standing here, looking to our left, we would see that road. And that road leads directly to the harbor. So there is no doubt in my mind that when Paul sailed from Ephesus, he took that street and went right down to the harbor, which is at the end of that street. And ahead of him was this hundreds of miles of sea journey. And he was determined to get there. I must, by all means, keep this coming feast. So that is the purpose of this message, to stir you up to have the attitude of Paul saying, here we are now at the feast season, the culmination of God's plan. And this is the attitude we need to have. By all means, we are going to keep this feast. You may have seen some of the uh, messages that uh, Mr. Shaby, our 
church president has put out urging us in the last couple of messages i believe he's urging us to keep this feast with all diligence to keep this feast reminding us of what the meaning of them is why it is so important they are lessons for us this is god's story is it not where he wants to tell us one more time for another year this plan of salvation it's marvelous to know this we know that he commanded them he commanded these feasts god himself he commanded israel to keep them and the, and the way they kept them although they were not perfect in keeping them they're a lesson for us now christ and the early new testament church keep kept them and that the evidence we see in the scriptures they kept these feasts and they reveal as i've said god's will they tell us the story that he wants us to hear again. The feast season now is going to tell us that story of his salvation, his plan for all of mankind, not only ourselves personally, but for all of mankind. And when we look on the world we see today, I think all of us, I know all of us agree, it needs fixing badly, badly. It's just getting worse and worse. We need to go to this feast and have that attitude. By all means, we must keep this feast. Now, our observance of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of all of the feast days, and the Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles, the last day, and they were about to, but all of the feast days, they set us apart from Christianity. Now, you may have had the opportunity, and I think many of us had at some point to explain to somebody what we believe. I have had that opportunity. Sometimes it's happened to me when I put down what my occupation is on uh, some document or uh, somebody asked me what I do for a living and I tell them and they, they say, well, that's interesting. What church is that? And uh, I tell them, it's the United Church of God. And says, oh, okay. But then I'd take that opportunity, I've done this. I said, but really what sets us apart, I've, this is how I've answered it numerous times, is that when you look at us, we keep the Sabbaths, we keep the holy days. That really sets us apart from Christianity, really most all of Christianity. So I wanna to review today the reason we keep this feast, the proof that we must keep this feast and stir us to action to keep this feast like Paul did with all diligence, by all means, to keep this feast. So we'll take a look at our fundamental belief. We'll start there. This is fundamental belief number 12. We believe that talking about the feast of God, and these are the statements in that fundamental belief. We believe in the commanded observance of the seven annual festivals that were given to ancient Israel by God. And truly again, brethren, that sets us apart from most all of Christianity. And as with all of God's commandments, everything he commands us to do is not because it's a burden, it's a blessing. It's not a burden, it's a blessing. And keeping the feasts and the commandments that God gave Israel was for their good. You know, he told them again and again, keep these feasts, keep my commandments because they are for your good. The next line of that fundamental belief is that these feasts were kept by Jesus Christ, by the apostles, and by the New Testament church. And the evidence of that is throughout the New Testament. We can see that. And we'll take a look at a few examples of that today. And we therefore follow that example. The next statement of this fundamental belief is that we see these feasts as one day being observed by all of mankind. We won't be 25, 30 people here 
in Vero Beach, keeping the Sabbaths and looking forward to the feast and all the other scattered places we are, but the whole world. That will be remarkable. That is going to be, um, I think, it's so inspiring to think about what God is doing when we see what he says in his scriptures about the entire world keeping these festivals. And then the statement says that these festivals, as I've said, they reveal the plan of God, God's plan of salvation. This is the answer in this story that we're repeating year after year, telling us what God is going to do and how he's going to fix everything that's wrong with the world. All the sorrows, all the pain, and the fact that we, he will do away with even death. Even death will be done away with. The picture of all that is so beautiful. We have this wonderful opportunity to look forward to that time and we can look around our world today and it, I think it motivates us even more. Wow, we've got to be there. We've got to go to the feast because look what's going on in the world. We've got to look for that solution, dedicate our lives to attaining to it, to getting there, to the kingdom of God that we are looking for. We are so blessed, brethren, to have this knowledge and to be convicted in this, as Paul himself was, saying, I must by all means, I must go there. I'm going to take this long journey to go to the feast. Likewise, that needs to be our attitude. And when we do them, when we keep these feasts, as I found, I know this to be true, as we keep them, our conviction of what they mean, our conviction of God's plan of salvation being real, the only answers that this world can possibly have to all of its problems, it becomes a deeper conviction. That conviction just grows as we keep these feasts year to year. When I first came into the church back in 1980, it was the summer of 1980, when I first was convicted of the Sabbath day. I remember reading the booklet, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, and there was that, that uh, chapter in there about the Sabbath day and why the blessings were being removed from our peoples, from the U.S. and Britain and our kindred peoples, because they've broken the laws of God. I read that chapter on the Sabbath day, and I was absolutely convinced I must keep the Sabbath. I was looking for the truth at that point. I really was looking, earnestly desiring, and God showed me that, and from that point on, I kept the Sabbath. But I didn't quite understand about the feast days. That was something I was not aware of. But I do remember when I asked the ministry to come over to my house, not long after that, maybe within the same month, I asked about these feasts, because I'd read it somewhere, about the fall festivals coming up. And they told me. It was late August, if I'm not mistaken, of 1980. So they told me the next feast would, of course, be trumpets and atonement. Actually, I think trumpets had already taken place. So I went to the service, my first Sabbath, and if I'm not mistaken, the very next service I went to was the Day of Atonement. And that year, the Feast of Tabernacles was, for the one and only time that I recall, in Detroit, Michigan. Oh, wow. And I grew up in Cleveland. It was three hours away, and I had $100. <laughs> and that was all I needed. I got there, took a Greyhound bus. My brother was engaged to a woman there and he was going to school in Detroit, and the woman's family took me in for that feast, and my brother loaned me his car. Wow. I kept the feast, literally, on $100. <laughs> now that's my story, but I was convinced I had to go. So let me use that example 
And like Paul's saying, I must by all means, I've got to go to see what this is and to learn. I have memories of that feast now that stick with me today. And when people tell us, you know what, those holy days are Old Testament. That's like the law. You guys are law keepers. You're putting a burden on yourself by keeping those Old Testament old things. Do we feel like the feast is a burden <laughs> like that? Not at all. Not at all. It is one of the greatest blessings that we have in our faith to be able to go to the festivals year after year after year and to fellowship with like-minded people, hear the word of God being preached, and have all kinds of physical blessings added to it. That is not a burden, not at all. And we're here today on the Sabbath day. Do you feel weighed down by that? <laughs> Is it a heavy load for you? Not at all. This is one of the greatest blessings that we have. And of course, people look at the scriptures, the gospels, and say, you know, you're like those Pharisees. You're binding heavy burdens hard to bear. And that's not the case at all. Of course, the scripture is not understood, and it's been twisted. This is a blessing to us, to keep the feast of God. And by all means, we must keep them. We have a great hymn on our hymnal. It's um, hymn number 102. It's God Speaks to Us. So you remember how that starts out with the trumpet blast? Dun, da, 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 da. God speaks to us. OK, God is speaking to us through his holy days, through his Sabbaths. Every week we come here, we're keeping this day and God is speaking to us and he's telling us over and over year after year his plan of salvation through the feast days what a blessing this is it's a rousing and powerful message in this hymn and we like to sing it at this time of the year it's one of those feast hymns especially on the feast of trumpets you might be singing this on the Feast of Trumpets coming a, a week from this, this Monday when we meet here. God speaks to us. God is revealing his will to us through these holy days. As we do his commandments and live his way of life, which includes keeping these feasts. There's a beautiful scripture, Psalm 1. Psalm 1, it says, it starts out, Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. And that is what we think about these feasts. When we're truly keeping them the way God wants us to, with the right attitude, the right approach, the wholeheartedness that he wants to put into them, we see the blessings of keeping this command as God has told us, as he's commanded us. And we take pleasure in these events that are coming up, these, these holy days. And he desires us to be zealous, to keep his commandments with all of our heart, mind, and soul, just as we do all of his, his word. Another scripture, Psalms 119, Verse 47, the psalmist writes here, it's a magnificent psalm, I will delight myself in keeping your commandments. That is my chief delight. That's the right attitude about keeping the holy days and keeping these feasts. I will delight myself in them. This attitude Delighting in keeping the law of God. That comes from a heart that is fully devoted to God, doing God's will with all of our heart. It brings us the only true satisfaction that we can have. When we are truly looking for righteousness, nothing else 
works unless we're doing this, delighting ourselves in the law of God, keeping the holy days as part of that, really delighting them in them. So we are very blessed to see the truth now in this present age, even though we're so small and scattered, to keep these holy days as forerunners for all of mankind. One day, the entire world is going to keep this feast. So again, as Paul says, I must, by all means, keep this coming feast. That is the attitude that we must have. So let me go into some of the reasons why. Now this is like a reproof or a proof of the reasons why we keep the feast. So we know all scripture is given by God for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, to make us complete. And so let's, let's take a look. Let's go to Leviticus 23, where we so often go at this holy day season, at all the holy day seasons, as we see here listed in their entirety, the, all of the holy days of God. Leviticus 23 and verse 2, God tells Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Mine. These are my feasts. They're not the Jews' feasts. They're God's feasts. These are mine. The next verse tells us about the Sabbath day, which is a feast day. As we're here today, we are celebrating the Sabbath, which is a feast day. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest. A holy convocation, meaning we're gathering together like we are right now. A holy convocation. You shall do no work in it. So we set aside those things. We're not doing our normal activities, not watching the baseball game, not watching you know, entertaining movies, but we're focusing on this day as being a day special and set apart. You shall do no work in it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all of your dwellings. These, verse 4, are the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. God makes these days holy, of course. Only he makes these days holy. And he sets them apart as something special to him. It's where he has that opportunity for us to come into his presence as we are now and to hear his word, to hear the story that he wants to tell. And the feast days are telling that story to us, the entire plan of God in them, as Leviticus 23 goes through all of them. You know, if we look at this and see the command of God and say, these are my feasts, if we have a heart for God, why would we not want to delight in them and take pleasure in them and say, I am keeping these days because God has commanded it. Now again, people will argue, oh, those are Old Testament. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So we approach these days with that respect and really admiration for what they are, that God has set them aside, that we appreciate them as his feasts, that he wants us to be there in a gathering, a holy gathering. And what we see here then after this verse, after verse 4, the next Verses in Leviticus 23 are really an expansion of the fourth commandment. All of the feasts are Sabbaths. The Sabbath command is, really applies to all of the holy days. Now God says, keep my Sabbaths. Keep my Sabbaths. The feasts, all of them 
our Sabbaths. I was talking about my personal example when I first came into the church. And I have to tell you, I did what the, the ministry was telling me to do, to keep these feasts. But I did not quite understand their meaning. Because I just had learned about them, I really didn't latch on to, to knowing like I know now, and with such conviction as I have now, that I must keep these feasts. But as I did them, because I could see they were commanded, and I was so convicted of the Sabbath, I couldn't not keep these feasts, all of them. And as I learned them, and as I learned how to keep them, and I think you could say the same thing, as you keep these feasts, they become as I'll call it, like part of the fabric of our lives. I cannot imagine my life without them. We go through this cycle every year where we run up to the holy days now, and we've been there before. I think all of us in this room have been there before, looking forward to those holy days. And some of us for years, and those have become part of our lives. We just wouldn't think of another way. We can't, we can't imagine another way. If we're keeping these the way God wants them, wants them to be kept, wants us to keep them, they become so much part of us, ingrained in us. And that's what I learned as I started to keep them. They became the fabric of my life, part, really a, a huge part of the fabric of my life and the, my understanding of the plan of God. So enhanced by keeping them. And so we're going to go down to verse 37 now. You, you know, again, this list in Leviticus 23 is all of the holy days. So as God has told all these holy days, he comes now to verse 37. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to make an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and a drink offerings, everything on its day. And then verse 38. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. If you look at those two verses, there's a lot going on there. Giving of offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, everything on its day, and your vows and your free will offerings, all of those things. What is this telling us, brethren? How do we relate that to our lives? What this is telling us is the service of God at his temple. And as we apply these verses to ourselves, we are engaged all of the time in the service of God at his holy place, which we know is not physically made with hands, but is the heavenly place. And we come continually with our offerings of praise and thanksgivings, our prayers and our free will offerings and our vows to that place. So this is the picture that is saying here. This is our life. This is our faith. This is describing our whole approach to our Heavenly Father. So these days, these feast days, are all of them Sabbath days. And we know that commandment. Keep the Sabbath. Keep it holy and that the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. It applies to every single of these feast days. So important for us that God wants us to be there, wants us to take part, and wholeheartedly enjoy them. They're not a burden. They are a blessing. And how are we going to enjoy them? What is the method God has set up for us to be able to go enjoy them? Well, he's given us the commandment of the second tithe, or the festival tithe, as we call this. It's very clear. 
you should, this is Deuteronomy 14 now, Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22 says to us, this is the method by which we're able to enjoy these days as God's command. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, all of it. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe. Enjoy that tithe. The tithe of your grain, verse 23, and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. What is this telling us? Go to the feast with your tithes. All of the feasts, this is this festival tithe. They're meant for all of the feast day, this festival tithe. And eat before the Lord as he commands and enjoy that time. Really enjoy it. The tithe, we know it's a very large portion of our income. And some of us are on fixed incomes on a, and we can't tithe all that much. But still he wants us to do it. To do it. And he says, don't forget, as verse 29 says, I don't have it on the screen, don't forget the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are with us. You know, as we've kept these holy days, uh, these feast days for years now, many of us, I think we could all look back and say, there were some really good times that we had at the feast because we were able to enjoy that festival tithe. For me, I look back when I was raising my children, and as I was thinking about this sermon, I remember going to the feast with my three kids. I was a single dad. I had all three kids with me, and I took my youngest golfing. It was a beautiful golf course, and I brought him to the feast. Of course, he didn't wasn't all that interested in church, but I had that time to spend with him at a beautiful golf course, uh, something we still do today. My son and I, whenever I'm in town, up at my hometown in Cleveland, we try to get in a golf game if we can. I'm not a great golfer, but I love being with him. And I was able to do that. One of, I think that was the first time we ever played. Another example that came to my mind was just a few years ago at the feast in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And a lot of our New England brethren were there as Will and I were in New England for those years. And a lot of them went to that feast. And so we went out as a group, a few of us, you know, there were about eight or 10 of us together. And we had the means to say, it's on us. And what a time that was. We're still talking about that. When we think about that with those who were there, what a night that was to be able to enjoy those things with our brethren to talk about our salvation together and the meaning of these holy days and to enjoy a meal like that. Some of the best memories of our feasts. When we go to the feast sites where we have so many other like-minded brethren with us at the holy days, uh, we, we can come together like that and worship God as one in a very special place, the place where God has chosen to put his name. The festival tithe. You, you may have done this, but my wife and I have um, realized that there are, I think we all need to realize that there are those who cannot go because they don't have enough to go, even though they faithfully tithe. And so we try to help those out where we can. And the United Church of God has a festival fund to help those who faithfully tithe or their situation is such they're not able to afford the feast. But we still want them to be there to enjoy it. So we have that that others contribute to. We have done that as well, contributed to that, so that others can enjoy that feast, not forgetting the widow, the stranger, and the fatherless. 
Verse 21 here says that you may learn, verse 23, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And as I related my experience, keeping these feasts and what they've done for me is that they taught me a greater and deeper appreciation for what God is doing, for his plan, that I may learn, that we may learn by doing them to fear the Lord. I recall coming back from a feast one day about, one year about 30 years ago, coming back to work and my boss knew where I'd been and he was a, a religious man, not in our faith, but, and he asked me about the feast. I came back, I was just charged up. And I just told him that going to this feast has deepened my conviction of the meaning of what God is doing. Something like that was my answer. It deepened my conviction. I became like this. I learned better how to fear the Lord. So that is one of the reasons God wants us to, to be there. Really, I think we might say the main reason that our faith can be strengthened, encouraged. We can become more deeply convicted and sure of his plan of salvation. In spite of all that we see around us, it, it doesn't look like the kingdom of God is here yet. <laughs> and it won't be any time well, we don't know how long, but it's certainly not here. But we're more deeply convicted as we go and keep these holy days that it will be here, that it is coming. That's what keeping the feast does for us, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. There's a beautiful proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As you learn how to more deeply fear God, as you're more deeply convicted in your faith and have a reverence for God, you grow in wisdom. You grow in wisdom. The wisdom of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, says this proverb, the second half of it, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So, the holy days, all of the feasts, ordained by God, commanded by God for our good to show us his plan and to help us to become more deeply convicted of our faith. The next major point of this sermon, of this message, is that Christ and the apostles and the New Testament church kept these holy days. And there's abundance, an abundance of scriptural evidence for that that Christ kept these days even from a boy. This verse here in Luke, Luke 2, 41, where it says, his parents went every year to Jerusalem to keep the feast of the Passover. And Christ was 12 years old in this account uh, in Luke chapter two, where he goes up with them to the feast as they did every year. This was always his custom. And as we go into his ministry, we see him also keeping the feasts and of course the Sabbaths. What was so remarkable about this is that Christ already knew by this point, as he told his parents, remember the story? He stays in Jerusalem, they go back to Galilee, they can't find him, they come back to Jerusalem, find him, he says to them at 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. He already knew that he was appointed by God. I don't know how much understanding he had at that time, but we know that he did become our Passover. So here he is at 12 years old and some Roughly 20 years later, he would become our Passover, the Lamb of God. It's a remarkable story. 
something to deeply think about. Christ from a youth kept the holy days. On another occasion, the Feast of Tabernacles, First John verse, uh, 7, verse 37, one, a scripture we often use on the last great day of the feast, the last day of the feast where he said Christ standing in that day, on the last great day of the feast, cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And this photo of this beautiful waterfall that I took uh, my, with my wife with me, and this was right near the place where we celebrated our wedding weekend. So this was a beautiful waterfall. Uh, just as an aside, it has a lot of meaning for me there. But the meaning of water at the feast, the holy days, especially the last great day, water representing the Spirit of God. And Christ saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Seeing this on the last day of the feast. It's just two examples here. We know there's more, that Christ kept the holy days, that he was our Passover, and he most certainly kept this Feast of Tabernacles. And if Christ did it, what more evidence do we need? Really, what more evidence do we need if Christ did them? As the Apostle John said, now this is from 1 John chapter 2, he who says he abides in him ought to also walk just as he walked. That should convict us that what Christ did, we must also do. He kept these holy days, therefore we must also. And likewise, we see the evidence of the New Testament church keeping these holy days, these biblical festivals, the church began on the day of Pentecost. And we're considering right now the example of the Apostle Paul who had to leave Ephesus and he said, I must by all means go to Jerusalem to keep this feast. There are two places in scripture that we can find quite easily where Paul arranges his travel plans around the Feast of Pentecost. Let's take a look. First one is in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8. He said, I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he would leave. So apparently that's where he was going when he said, I must by all means keep this feast. In the other one, he, Acts 20, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And we also see, we use it every year at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, what Paul told the Corinthians, let us keep this feast, not with the old leaven, but with the, uh, nor with the unleaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, telling the Corinthians, keep the feast. It's clear that the New Testament church kept these holy days. And then there's also this scripture. This is Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17 which is used by many to preach against keeping the feast. But what does Paul say here to these Colossians about the feast? Don't let anyone judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. So what was happening here? There were Judaizers who wanted the Gentiles to be like them. These were Gentile Christians. And they said, oh, no, you've, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to become like a Jew in order to keep these holy days. They were being judged for their keeping of them and for the manner in which they were keeping them. Don't let anybody judge you. 
they were, when you look at here, it says the new moons or the Sabbaths. The moons has a, a reference to the calendar. They were keeping a holy Hebrew, the Hebrew as we call it, the Hebrew calendar. Don't let anybody judge you in that. These things are, verse 17, a shadow of things to come, are they not? The whole plan of God is revealed in the holy days. They're a shadow of things to come, and the substance of them is Christ. All of it. All of it. This was what Paul was telling them. Don't let those Judaizers or those who tell you you must do these things, these physical things, which are not required in order to keep these, these holy days. Think about this for a moment, brethren. If Paul were keeping a feast, which is clear, but he wasn't telling the Corinthians to keep the feast, don't, don't let any budget buddy judge you, I mean, does that make sense? Does it make sense? Think of it this way. Say the ministry, or some ministers, kept the holy days and Sabbaths that we know, like Mr. Shaby or Mr. Smith, and it says, you guys don't need to do that. It's, it's okay. Well, you, you, it, that does not hold water. It doesn't make sense. And that is an argument that people put forward. That Paul was a Jew, that's why he kept the Jewish feasts. How could that be? Not true. It doesn't hold water not believable. And think of what the disunity it would cause us today. If that were the case, where some ministers did it and others didn't, it would not be unity at all. Oh, this, we could just throw that one out. <laughs> it's a Jewish feast. Well, it, these are God's feasts. No. We are one body, as Ephesians 4, verse 4 tells us, we are one body and one spirit. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Some of us are not over here keeping the feasts and the holy days and the Sabbaths and others not. That is not oneness. We are one body and one spirit. So when we look at the New Testament, the apostles are consistent in their message. We must follow Christ in all things. And the scriptural of evidence abounds that he kept the feasts as well as the New Testament church. They kept them all. And therefore, if they were so dedicated to them, to keeping them, then we ought to be like that like Paul, again, by all means, to keep this coming feast. And one day, brethren, we know the entire world will keep the feast. One of the scriptures that we often quote at this time, and this is a good one to remember if you ever talk to somebody about the feasts, why we keep them, it's right here, Zechariah 14, Verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone who was left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah's second last book of the Old Testament. This is right at the end of the chapter. So if you want to Quickly go to a Bible while you're discussing why you keep the holy days. Well, we're just forerunners of the rest of mankind because everyone will keep the feasts. The entire world will be keeping the feasts. From ancient Israel to the millennium and beyond, the feast of the Lord are held in Jerusalem. And they will be. Jerusalem. They'll go up there to Jerusalem to keep the feasts. It's very, very plain. Jerusalem is the geographical focal point of God's work on earth. All nations will come there. And we can look into Ezekiel in the last nine chapters of Ezekiel explaining about a millennial temple and a city that is built in Jerusalem. What's it for? 
for the whole world to come up to keep the feast. Another beautiful scripture we like to read at this time is Isaiah 2. This one to me is always inspiring, especially at this time of the year. Isaiah chapter 2, one that gives us so much hope for what's coming. Isaiah 2 and verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And as we understand what mountains and hills means, that means governments, nations. The, the mountain of the Lord established, or the government of the Lord established above all of them and exalted above all of them. And all nations, as verse 2 says, shall flow to it. And then verse 3, and many people, many people shall come and say, come. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This is so beautiful because this is going to happen. The whole world keeping the feast. He will teach us his ways. Can you imagine the world wanting to know the ways of God? Wow. That is awesome to think about. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of the zion zion is the dwelling place of god shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem what an image that is what a beautiful scripture it should inspire us and it does to keep these feasts by all means another beautiful scripture telling us about what's coming is Isaiah 25. If you want to turn there to Isaiah 25, it tells us about the feast that God is planning for all peoples. In verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 6, And in this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine, Wines on lees of fat, of fat things full of marrow of well-refined wine on the lees. We know this is not just physically speaking about the feast, but spiritually as well. Fat things full of marrow, the word of God that they can, I guess you could say, sink their teeth into and drink it in. You know, this picture here, when I look at that photo, I get hungry. <laughs> that, I, I can picture that as being one of my meals at the feast. You know, the really succulent steak done just the way I like it, and that beautiful wine there. You know, the feet, uh, fat things full of marrow, it is like um, good meat, the choice pieces, the best pieces of the, the meat of, the, of the, uh, the best pieces of steak and wine on lees. You know what lees are, L-E-E-S. Those are the things that precipitate from good wine. So when the wine has been aged very well, there's a little bit of sediment in the bottom of it. And those are the lees because it's been aged well of well-refined wine. So this is, a, this is a physical image, but is also a spiritual image telling us about the choice pieces that God wants us to eat of his word and the beautiful things that he wants us to drink in of it. And then the next verse says in Isaiah 25, and he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people. What's that talking about? The blindness that is covering the face of all people because they do not see the word of God. It will be destroyed, that blindness, and taken away. The veil, as, as it says, that is spread over all nations. This is what we're picturing coming up in these holy days. And verse 8, beautiful. He will swallow up death forever. 
and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. I look at that, brethren, and I see, oh, how I want to see that day. And this, the wiping away tears from all faces, taking away all pain, suffering, sorrow, this is Revelation 21.4, one of my favorite verses. There's, I have a lot of them, but that's one of them, that God will, himself will dwell with men and wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, for the former things are passed away. That's Revelation 21.4 comes from this verse, at least part of this. Isaiah 25, verse 8. They wipe away tears from all faces. Death gone. No more death. No more sorrow, pain. The rebuke of his people he will take away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. God said this. Therefore, we believe it. It's coming. It's going to happen. And this, for me, brethren, and I hope for you, stirs you to say, oh, I want to go to this feast. And I want to be there. In verse 9, then, of Isaiah 25, And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's inspiring. To know the people of this earth will no longer have that veil cast over their eyes and say, This is God. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. Although they don't know they're waiting for him, but they are. And he will come and save them. He will and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation, the whole world, keeping these holy days. Another beautiful scripture that we could see that the whole world is going to keep these days. This is a, a psalm, scripture from a psalm, 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Has that happened yet? No. Not yet, but it will. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Brethren, we are now, with the information we have, standing in awe of him and his plan for all of mankind. The festivals, they reveal the plan of God. They show us and remind us of that great hope that we have. This is a scripture from Ephesians now. What God has shown us, we wrap this up here. Ephesians 1, verse, verse 9. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. We know the will of God. He has made it known to us. He has made us part of that knowledge to share it. And the part of that, a big part of it, is keeping this festival so that our understanding and conviction of what his plan is, is deepened. He has shown us the mystery of his will. As uh, Ephesians 1 verse 10 continues, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and that sounds like a big mouthful there, but the completion of the plan of God, you might say, that in the completion of the plan of God, or the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. This is the knowledge we have, brethren, the feast days show us that will. They remind us that God, through Jesus Christ, is working out a salvation, a plan of salvation for all of mankind, salvation from sin and death, and having, like we do now, the gift of eternal life, and being offered, like we are now, to be a part of the family 
of God. So an often used verse that encourages us to not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's Hebrews 10, verse 25. We say that oftentimes. We must come to keep these feasts. Assemble together. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, as the scripture says, as is the manner of some, but exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Like Paul, let us by all means keep this feast, because, in recap, they are God's feasts. Christ and the New Testament church kept them. The evidence is abundant, and one day soon, the entire world will also do that. Do keep these feasts. So Paul, as we read in Acts, he said, he took leave of them saying, I must, by all means, keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. Let us also, by all means, keep this coming feast.